Okay, let's go ahead and, and uh, take a look at another topic that many people around the state are talking about, education. You said it's one of the top three things that people have on their mind when they come up and talk to you at all the places that you're visiting around the state. And I'm gonna go over to Aaron Einhorn for our first questions about education. Yeah, we heard from several people in our audience who asked questions about education. Judith specifically wanted to know what your plans are for schools. Do you believe that schools in Michigan have the resources that they need to succeed to serve all students, including those with special needs? And do you think that our schools are funded equitably? Mm. Well, there's a lot of questions in there that one question. Questions. Sorry about I, that. I, I think <laughs> we're, we're in trouble education-wise in the state. Uh, we have way too many kids who can't read, way too many kids that are not prepared for college. We've pushed our kids to college until it's sickening. And it's not just counselors and educators that have done that, but it's been parents thinking that they want the best for their child, and so that means go to college. And when they say, well, you know, I don't know what to study, uh, the parent or the counselor will say, well, you'll figure it out when you're there. That increases the length of time in college that uh, uh, when you're not prepared, that increases the amount of uh, remedial education that you need. We know 50% of those who start uh, in a college uh, pathway don't graduate by six years, so it, it's an issue. I believe that we need to go back to the basics when it comes to education, reading, writing, arithmetic, and, and, and I would add character building. Um, I believe that school choice is, is important and local control is important. I would get rid of Common Core in this whole scenario that we're talking about. I believe that we need coaches, reading coaches in the classroom. Uh, we're in trouble in, in reading and in math, and I believe that reading coaches would be very helpful so that anybody in this room uh, could go in and sit with a child and read one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two. That, that's not going to be enough, though. Are the schools, do the schools have the resources they need, and are they funded equitably? That was the question. So th the, the question of funding the problem that we have can't be solved by money. If we look at the last seven years, we've had an extra $1.8 billion pumped into education, and our reading scores are worse than they were before. So uh, money is not the solution. Although in the educational part that we're talking about, I believe we do need more funding, particularly for training teachers in how kids learn to read and looking at the variety of means that kids learn to read. I, I like phonics because I, I learned with phonics. I've done a lot of international work. I'm uh, fluent in a number of languages and each of those languages we use phonics to learn the, the language and so that's critically important. Uh, teachers, they, they need that education and most teachers do not learn how kids read and so the funding particularly is important. Uh, there's there are school districts, especially when you look at the upper part of Michigan, that are not funded adequately. And uh, th there's, a, there's a gap, and that gap needs to be narrowed as, as quickly as possible and, and as much as possible. Okay, given that uh, test scores are often driven by socioeconomic and other factors, do you think that the state's current accountability system of measuring schools gives parents a fair and accurate measure of how our schools are doing? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of confusion. Uh, parents don't really understand the quality of education that they, their, their child is getting at a particular school. And so I believe that parents need to be involved. I don't think an A through F system is going to do that. I think that parents have to actually know what's being taught in the classroom and know who the teacher is and know what's being taught. In addition to that, we know, I have seven sons, they all learn different in different manners, and uh, my patients, as they talk to me, you know that there will be uh, a mom that will have three children in three different schools, and I'll ask, well, why? And they'll say, well, because uh, this, this Joey learns this way, and so this charter school is best for him, but this traditional public school is best for this one, and this one I'm homeschooling. And so I see uh, many parents choosing a variety of means of teaching their kids, and um, so we don't want to trap kids in one school system because one school system or one, one school uh, might not fit all the kids that, that uh, a family might have uh, access to. So I think school choice is, is critically important if we want to get the education for our kids that's necessary. 
and that takes into account social economics, uh, dyslexia, a number of other learning disabilities uh, where English is not the first language. Those all have to be taken into account. Should the state be involved in deciding um, when a school should be closed for poor performance? The, the, the state um, probably should be somewhat involved, but I think local control and, and school <laughs> boards and parents should be involved in knowing how a school's doing, education-wise, how a teacher's doing. And so I would like to see local, a local municipality taking control of that and the state perhaps uh, a supervisory role. Steve, you want to go ahead and jump in with your question on Detroit Community Schools. Yes, um, Detroit Public Schools, uh, the largest school district in the state, recently released a facilities review report that found it'll cost $500 million to upgrade school facilities to bring them up to current standards. But the state won't let the district borrow money for renovations. What help, if any, should come from Lansing for this problem? Mm. When you look at the Detroit school system, um, I, I look at more than just traditional public schools, but also the charter school system. And it's a complicated issue because half of the students in Detroit attend charter schools, and uh, the half, that half that came from the traditional public school system have, have vacated uh, those schools and taken their, their state money with them. And so uh, now you have facilities, large facilities, that are not vacant, but uh, you know the enrollment is very low. They have leaky roofs and so forth. And so I think that municipalities need to figure out how they're going to work with charter schools to be the best that they can be. What we see in the private sector is that when you have two businesses and they're competing, they get better. It gets cheaper. I have not seen that happen in the traditional public school system. It needs to happen. I believe that traditional public schools have a lot to offer. In fact, uh, four of my kids attended a traditional public school um, at the same time that they were attending a parochial school. So they went to the traditional school for certain subjects that weren't offered at a parochial school. And so I think the traditional public schools, they have a tremendous amount to offer, not just uh, in the languages, but in the sciences, uh, physics and chemistry and sports and band and art and so forth. Uh, which are not offered in many charter schools or even parochial schools. And so there's a lot to offer, but you, I don't believe that Detroit public schools can maintain their large structure that they had before charter schools came into existence. What part should Lansing have in that? A supervisory low, uh, role. I think that the, the majority of it should come from Detroit. How, how can we solve this issue? How can we become leaner, meaner, better teachers? After all, it's the parents who take their students away from the traditional public schools to other school systems. Mm, but the, the, the question was about upgrading facilities, mm -hmm. um, not whether traditional public schools or charter schools are better. To improve the quality in the traditional schools, we have to do something about the, the buildings which are in bad shape. Should Lansing contribute at least something towards the physical upkeep of these buildings? I wouldn't be opposed if Lansing made a small contribution, but it's not going to be a large enough contribution to revamp a crumbling infrastructure of the school system in Detroit. They're going to have to figure that out on their own, whether it's private sector dollars, uh, whether it's federal dollars, those types of things. I want to follow up on something that you said when you were speaking to Aaron, talking about how money doesn't solve everything when it comes to educational funding, but that you would put more money into teacher training and you would put more money into literacy programs. So if voters hear that, they say, where is that money going to come from and where do you think that you'd get those money, uh, the dollars allocated from? Mm -hmm. I think the dollars are already there. And uh, again, $1.8 billion in addition has gone to the school systems in in the last seven years with very little to show for it. If you look at um, uh, the uh, preschool and uh, the early education of kids, m millions of dollars has been they have been pumped into that system and the kids' scores are even lower than they were at the beginning. And uh, so I don't think the money is the answer. I think that when we talk about bringing coaches in, those are voluntary individuals. Those are grandpas and grandmas and moms and dads that are considered. The education for those teachers is going to be 
uh, available through the regular funding process for teacher uh, education. Okay. Hassan, you had a question about charter schools. Well, yeah, you, you already touched on the need for choice in the education system, but I wonder what you think of, about the need for reform and how charter schools are governed or funded. Mm -hmm. So when you look at uh, charter schools, and I've been in uh, half a dozen charter schools uh, looking at curriculum and um, meeting with right. teachers and so forth, I like charter schools as an option. It's an option that parents have. I think it's a good option. Um, should they be more supervised than they are? I think that uh, rests to be determined. Um, should charter schools be allowed to be profitable? Why not? You know, if a school can can do what they need to do and still be profitable at the same time and educate the children, I see no reason that they shouldn't be profitable. Should money allocated for public schools be used to also fund charter schools? Well, of course, charter schools are public schools, and uh, so the dollars follow the child. So when the child goes from a traditional public school to a charter school or vice versa, the money follows. And so the answer to that is yes. Let me ask you about something you said about Common Core. You said that we should get rid of common, the Common Core. Why? As, uh, as I've uh, spoken to dozens and dozens of teachers and parents, um, what we see is we see uh, teachers spending a lot of time, if not a majority of the time, teaching to the test. And uh, though when you do that, that doesn't prepare kids for other subjects that need to be taught. And so teachers are complaining that, and, and severely, that uh, their students are not learning, they feel are not learning what needs to be taught as a teacher, in their opinion, what needs to be taught because they're teaching to the test. Um, and a uh, second complaint is that everybody kind of ends up learning a certain body of information, and those that are, that are talented and could excel, don't excel. And uh, those are at the bottom, it may bring them up, but uh, it doesn't allow those students that would normally excel to excel. Erin? What can the state do about the high cost of childcare and the lack of preschool options for young children? It's a huge problem. And I, and I frankly, I don't know the, the solution to that. Um, you have moms who would like to work but can't work because they have children. And uh, in many situations, it's grandpa and grandma that watch those kids so that mom can work, mom can get an education. And so that works, that works very well. I think that when you, when you discuss, well, let's set up a day, daycare center that the state is going to fund, uh, I'm hesitant to start something like that. If the private sector would like to do that, I think that's great. I know of a number of uh, families where uh, they take their kids to a parent's home and uh, the, the moms or the dads go and work and then they come home. And so you have uh, communities that come together to, to deal with that situation. But I think having the state uh, fund something uh, for uh, parents to watch their kids so that they can go to work is, is probably not viable. So you don't think the state should be subsidizing child care or, or, or funding preschool in any way? I don't think so. Oh, so you would end all of those programs as I, well? I, I, I would consider ending those programs. I want to ask you a little bit about governance structure. Um, there has been a lot of talk about the way that education is shepherded in the state with the state elected school board and then the school board appoints the superintendent um, and then the governor's office doesn't have a whole lot to do with it is a different governance model than a lot of other states that are more successful at their education around the country. Would you change the governance structure of the Michigan Department of Education should you become governor? I would be in favor of the governor being in charge of the Board of Education and have oversight. Okay. Sandy. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about higher education. Uh, costs have, of course, gone up in the state. Wondering if you think that the costs of colleges and universities now are prohibitive and what you would do as governor, what you could do as governor to find some relief in that. Yeah, I think th the costs are huge. Um, it's, it's large. It's, it's burdensome. Uh, there are many things that families can do to reduce those costs, and I think dual enrollment is, is a key. I had uh, two of my sons who uh, did dual enrollments. One started at Michigan as a, a junior. The other one started at Cedarville in Ohio as a sophomore. Uh, so 
I think that that is a, a huge thing that can be done. I think a second thing that's very important is to make sure that kids are ready for college so that they can read, that they can write, that they can do math so that they're not having to take remedial classes and extend the period of time that they're, they're at the university. So I think that's critically important. Um, another aspect is that kids need to know what they want to study. We need to change this idea that, oh, you'll go to college and there you'll learn what you want to study. And that leads to multiple major, uh, major changes. Uh, so they're changing from one major to another to another and extending uh, their time in college uh, to six years or seven years or not graduating. And then, of course, uh, there's a whole group of individuals that are pushed to college that would really uh, be great in the vocational trades. What about the universities themselves? Uh, you talk about the student side of things. What about university administrations and the state? Yeah, I think, I think that schools can cut costs. It's interesting that it seems as though the higher the tuition, the more students you have applying to go to that school. And somehow, uh, the higher the tuition, um, the better the school, and that's not necessarily at all true. Um, computer education, I think, is important. Uh, what schools can do to cut down costs I think to encourage uh, freshmen to know what they want to study when they're there and uh, to promote summer school, to promote graduating in three years rather than four years. Um, I think uh, community colleges are a great way for us to, to have a, a decrease in cost of higher education because it's so much cheaper in a community college. It allows students to figure out what they want to do and to take a bunch of different classes that are is a third the cost of a, a, a regular college or university and uh, so that cuts costs. Okay. Before we leave the topic of ed education, Dr. Hines, how would you rank um, Michigan's education system in terms of some of the issues that we have here? Uh, also in terms of what, how would you attack it when you become governor? How um, high a priority is changing what we're doing with our education K-12 system? I, I think it's a huge priority. Uh, I mean, we have kids uh, ten going to college that, that uh, you find out really don't want a college education or don't need a college education. So that, that's very important that we send kids to college that, ne that need and want to go to college, that have an idea of what they want to study, and stop sending kids to college just because that's the thing to do. That will, that will mean changing the thinking of parents, uh, counselors, uh, schools. I, I think that we, we need to realize that the university is, is to prepare young people for a profession, for uh, either advanced studies, graduate studies, uh, or um, whatever they choose to do, and then to offer majors that are going to be significant that you can get a job in. And um, so this goes to your question a little bit too, and that is having you know a third of your majors be in subjects that we don't need in the workforce. I think that's a very important thing that has to be looked at and children and, and uh, kids and moms and dads need to understand that if you get a major in this particular thing there is a uh, there's a flood of applicants working towards that and that when you get out you might not have a job and I think a good example is ultrasonography the ability to do an ultrasound and to look inside someone uh, there's a glut in the market and so uh, if uh, someone comes to me wanting to know, well, Dr. Hines, what do you think about ultrasound versus x-ray versus CAT scans versus MRIs? I have that ability to say, well, I wouldn't do ultrasound because uh, for every opening, there's, there's 10 individuals that can't find a job. And so I think schools partnering with the workforce to know what jobs out there is beneficial in this, question, in, in, in this area. I'm interested in what majors don't have a link to jobs. Which ones would you have colleges eliminate? <laughs> and you can't say journalism. I can't say journalism. <laughs> no. Um, I, I think that when you uh, when you go out into the workforce and you talk to individuals over and over and over again, you have individuals say, you know, I majored in math, for example, mathematics, or I majored in chemistry and I'm not doing math or chemistry at all. And I'll ask, well, did it prepare you for the job that you're doing? They'll say, well, well, no. What they didn't realize is that if you're going to be a math, if, if you want to be a math major and have a significant job and you're not a teacher, 
you're going to end up going all the way to the point where you get a PhD. Well, a PhD in mathematics pays how much versus what you're making now. And so those discussions are intimate discussions one-on-one -on -one that you have with individuals. So even a topic like math or chemistry for an individual, you may not be able to get a job in. So we should eliminate math majors? No, <laughs> not at all. And wh what subject should we eliminate if they're not leading directly to jobs? What would you, I mean, if you're, if you're looking at the course catalog at a university, what are you cutting out of it? You know, I have to look at it. I don't have any answer to that. Okay. Just not journalism. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you could answer that. 